You're watching Study with Sudhir. This is your digital classroom. My name is T.S. Sudhir. We are looking at the CBSE Class 11 English syllabus and we are looking specifically at the Hornbill textbook. But before we start, this is the place where you'll find the entire Class 11 English syllabus, every poem, every story done in great detail, line by line explanation, word by word explanation, and explanation of all the themes and the poetic devices in every poem. Okay, so in case if you have not subscribed, this is your time to press on the subscribe button and also press on the bell icon so that you can get all the regular notifications, right? So let's get started without wasting any time. So we are looking at this chapter called we are not afraid to die if we can all be together. So it's a rather long title for a story and is written by Gordon Cook and Alan East, right? Uh, what is the story all about? It's an adventure story. Okay, it's an adventure story and the theme is about what a family is all about. It's also about courage in the face of great adversity. You know, कि किस तरह की हिम्मत दिखाने की जरूरत पड़ती है जब बहुत ज्यादा एक तरह से मुसीबत में एक परिवार फंसता है एन एज डज नॉट मैटर इट कैन इवन बी ए चाइल्ड एज वी विल सी इन दिस स्टोरी हु कैन एक्चुअली डेमोन्स्ट्रेट ए लॉर्ड ऑफ करेज ओके द थीम ऑफ वॉट रियली मैटर्स इन लाइफ एंड दैट्स वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट बिकॉज how you react to a situation is often very relative suppose for example you know somebody has had an accident he has broken his leg in an accident at that point in time till he recovers he will think that this is all i want from life right now right but the moment he recovers his demand or his wish from life may change to something completely different so everything at any point in time in life is actually very very relative at this time they are battling to save their ship and their life right six passengers in all four members of a family and two other sailors and all they want to do is to reach that remote island so that they can save themselves so this is an adventurous story a lot of drama on the high seas and that's what we will read we'll read through the story and i'll keep explaining some of the key words otherwise the story is pretty um, uh, easy to understand it has a lot of seafaring terms you know which you should be familiar with you should have a basic idea about what each term means uh, but when you're writing your answers what you will be expected to do and this is important is that you should you will you will be expected to kind of demonstrate your understanding of the larger theme of the story and not specifically about xyz c related term right i hope i made myself clear in July 1976, my wife Mary, son Jonathan, six years old, daughter Suzanne, seven years old, and I set sail from Plymouth in England to duplicate the round-the-world voyage made 200 years earlier by Captain James Cook. For the longest time, Mary and I, a 37-year-old businessman, had dreamt of sailing in the wake of the famous explorer, and for the past 16 years, we had spent all our leisure time Honing our seafaring skills in British waters. Honing our seafaring skills essentially means, you know, we kind of kept practicing in British waters about how life on the high seas could actually be, but we needed to be kind of prepared to be on the sea, prepared, you know, on the sea you generally experience a lot of seasickness, you know, samudra mein jada der rehne se ek tarah se bimari ho jati hai. Uh, vomiting aata hai. So, you know, you need to be prepared and you need your your body system has to kind of acclimatize itself. Acclimatize as in ek se preparation hona chahiye ki kya aap samudar par itne din reh sakte hai ya nahi. What they are trying to do is that 200 saal pehle jo kaptan James Cook ne jis sarah ka daura lagaya tha voyage that he undertook around the world they wanted to duplicate it. They wanted to do the same on the same route. Okay, so that was his wish. He, his wife and two little children, one six years old, one seven years old, right? Uh, and they had spent the last 16 years, 16 saal se, way us sapne ko sakar karne ki koshish kar rahe hain. Okay, their boat was called Waywalker. Okay, a 23 meter, 30 ton wooden hulled beauty had been professionally built 
and we had spent months fitting it out and testing it in the roughest weather we could find. So they were kind of trying to simulate, simulate as in trying to put it in actual kind of conditions as close as possible so that when the time comes on the high seas where the weather will be very rough, the waters will be very choppy, they should be ideally prepared for that kind of an eventuality. Okay. Voyage ka matlab kya hota hai? A long kind of a journey which is undertaken by sea, right? Uh, honing in this particular case essentially means that you kind of trying to improve your skills, you know. The more moment time you spend on kind of seeing what kind of conditions would be there, they are trying that on the in British uh, waters, in British sea, uh, they would be getting better at it. Uh, wooden hull is essentially the body of a ship made of wood, okay? Uh, the first leg of our planned three year 105000, 1,5,000 kilometer journey passed pleasantly as we sailed down the west coast of Africa to Cape Town, Cape Town which is in South Africa. There before heading east, we took on two crewmen, American Larry Vigil and Swiss Herb Siegler to help us tackle one of the world's roughest seas, the Southern Indian Ocean which kind of extends right from down of India, Sri Lanka, right up till where it is close to Australia, right? The entire uh, ocean. So this was the length of the journey. You would do well to kind of know all these basic facts that they wanted to be there on the sea for three years. This is the distance they wanted to uh, traverse in, as part of the journey. And who are the other two crewmen that they took on board? their ship okay and the southern indian ocean was expected to be one of the most roughest sea most rough seas on our second day out of cape town or they have left cape town we began to encounter strong gales gales as in which is basically very very strong winds uh, and sea may obviously is tarah ki jo hawa hai it's very very strong and the ship has to be in a position to kind of tackle it otherwise the ship could capsize palti mar sakta hai for the next few weeks, they blew continuously, these gales. Gales did not worry me, but the size of the waves was alarming. Up to 15 meters, as high as our main mast. So, the waves were as high, they could completely drown the ship because they were as high as the mast of the ship. The mast is essentially the big structure which is kept on top of the boat or the ship. December 25, Christmas, found us 3,500 kilometers east of Cape Town. Despite atrocious weather, we had a wonderful holiday complete with a Christmas tree. So they even made a Christmas tree on the ship. New Year's Day, a week later, saw no improvement in the weather. But we reasoned that it had to change soon. And it did change for the worse. It got worse as they stepped into the New Year. At dawn on January 2, the waves were gigantic. We were sailing with only a small storm jib. Jib essentially is what is called a triangular sail set forward the mast in a ship. Okay, that is the technical definition of a jib. Okay, and we were still making 8 knots. Knots is the unit of speed equal to 1 nautical mile per hour. Use especially both it's used for in aircraft. It's also used in ships who are on sail. As the ship, as the ship, uh, and it's a nautical mile of 6,080 feet, 6,080 feet. As the ship rose to each, to the top of each wave, we could see an no endless enormous seas rolling towards us and the screaming of the wind and the spray was painful to the ears. To slow the boat down, we storm, dropped the storm jib and lashed a heavy mooring rope a rope in a loop across the stern. Now stern is the back part, the back back portion of the boat or the ship. Okay, then we double lashed everything, went through our life raft drill, attached lifelines, donned oil skins and life jackets and waited. So they were all prepared and you may just underline some of these technical terms because you just need to use those terms if they ask you specifics about what were they doing at a particular point in time. But otherwise, as I said, the story is more about the courage and how they reacted in those moments of sheer adversity. The first indication of impending disaster came at about 6 p.m. with an ominous silence. Now, ominous essentially is something which conveys a lot of danger, right? And that's what you need to know. It's something which almost is kind of very threatening in its nature. The wind dropped and the sky immediately 
grew dark. Then came a growing roar and an enormous and the sky immediately a growing roar and an enormous cloud towered aft of the ship. Okay, aft as in with near the stern of the ship, the backside. With horror, I realized that it was not a cloud, but a wave like no other I had ever seen. It appeared perfectly vertical and almost twice the height of other waves with a frightful breaking crest. Crest is the, the top of the wave. Okay, crest is also used in case of a hill or a mountain uh, to indicate the top portion. The roar increased to a thunder as the stern moved up the face of the wave and for a moment I thought we might ride over it. You know, when the waves come, the, the ability of the captain of the ship, the sailors to be able to navigate, to be able to negotiate the height of the wave is actually what tests the real resourcefulness of the sailors or the captain who is commanding the ship. So he thought that we might be able to ride over it. But then a tremendous explosion shook the deck. A torrent of green, torrent as in you say a torrent of water, you know. So a sudden gust of water, a torrent uh, of green and white water broke over the ship. My head smashed into the wheel and I was aware of flying overboard and sinking below the waves. I accepted my approaching death and as I was losing consciousness, I felt quite peaceful. So you see, the first casualty in a sense has happened when this wave hit the particular ship, wave walker. And as a result of which, the, the main protagonist of this particular story uh, gets injured. Okay, so that is something which you would need to note what happens right at the beginning of the story. Unexpectedly, and he says, I felt quite peaceful at that point in time. The roar increased, uh, sorry, unexpectedly, my head popped out of the water. A few meters away, wave walker was near capsizing. It was almost going to go under and uh, go under the water and basically have an accident. Her mass almost horizontal. Then a wave hurled her upright. My lifeline jerked taut. I grabbed the guardrails and sailed through the air into wave walker's main boom. Now, boom, uh, taut is something which you kind of make it very, very tight. You know, when you buy pulling or stretching. Boom is essentially the pole which controls the shape of the sail, you know, the peculiar angle at which the sail is supposed to be. Subsequent waves tossed me around the deck like a rag doll, you know, it's almost rag doll means something which is not in great shape. My left ribs cracked, my mouth filled with blood and broken teeth. Somehow I found the wheel, lined up the stern for the next wave and hung on. So he's injured, badly wounded, but he's still holding on. Okay, because he needs to hold on because he's really the person who is in charge of that particular ship. Water, water everywhere. I could see that the ship had water. Uh, below but i dared not abandon the wheel to investigate suddenly the front hatch was thrown open and mary appeared we are sinking she screamed the decks are smashed we are full of water okay so there is panic which has kind of set in uh, and uh, mary kind of coming in and saying that we are about to sink take the wheel i shouted as i scrambled for the hatch now hatch is the door Larry and Herb were pumping like madmen, the two sailors. Broken timbers hung at crazy angles. So the, the ship had kind of suffered a whole lot of damage because of the impact of the wave. The whole starboard side bulged inwards. Clothes, crockery, charts, tins and toys sloshed about in deep water. Sloshed as in they were all floating. They are completely underwater. I half swam, half crawled. So you can imagine the kind of... Uh, impact the wave has had on the the waves have had on the ship into the children's cabin because he is obviously concerned about how safe they were at that point in time are you all right i asked yes they answered from an upper bunk you know so they were kind of trying to ensure that they were not kind of underwater even if water had entered the cabin they were kind of safe on an upper bunk but my head hurts a bit said sue pointing to a big bump above her ears I had no time to worry about bumped heads. So that was not something which he was particularly bothered about right then because there were bigger injuries and bigger adversities to take care of right then. After finding a hammer, so at that point in time you may think it's a little insensitive but later on in the story we will find what really happened with Sue. After finding a hammer, screws and canvas, I struggled back on deck. With the starboard side bashed open, we were taking water with each wave that broke over us. 
if I couldn't make some repairs, we would surely sink. So it is giving a sense of all that is happening on Wavewalker right then. Somehow I managed to stretch canvas and secure waterproof hatch covers across the gaping holes. Some water continued to stream below but most of it was now being deflected over the side. More problems arose when our hand pumps started to block up with debris. Now, along with the waves, the sea was also throwing in a lot of garbage into the, sea, into the ship. As a result of which, their basic hand pumps were actually beginning to clog. Okay. And the electric pump became, suffered a short circuit. Right. So, as a result of which, you would now realize that the engines will not work if there is no electricity on that particular ship. The water level rose threateningly. Back on deck, I found that our two spare hand pumps had been wrenched overboard. Along with the four stay sail, the jib, the dinghies. Dinghies is a small kind of a boat and the main anchor. Okay, then I remembered we had another electric pump under the chart room floor. I connected it to an out pipe and was thankful to find that it worked. So basically what is being related is all that action, the dramatic action that is taking place on Wave Walker even while trying to save the ship and the six lives on board. The night dragged on with an endless, bitterly cold routine of pumping, steering and working the radio. Working the radio because they also need to kind of communicate the state they are in in order to be able to send an SOS call, a, an emergency call, a distress call asking for help to any of the coast guards or any of the ships etc which would be there in the vicinity to provide them with some kind of help and relief. We were getting no replies to our Mayday calls. Mayday calls is essentially this kind of SOS distress calls asking for help, right? Which are not surprising in this remote corner of the world because it is really very remote and obviously there is no one there in the vicinity. Sue's head had swollen alarmingly. This is important. She had two enormous black eyes. At that point in time, she had said she had suffered a bump. But now, the injury was actually much more serious than she had revealed to her father then. When I asked her why she had not made more of her injuries before this, that is, you, you did not fuss more about her injury, she replied, I did not want to worry you when you were trying to save us all. So just see the kind of uh, responsible behavior on part of a seven-year-old child that she realizes that that was not the point to bother her father about it that he was trying to do something much more important in order to save everyone than to bother and worry about her injury on her head the bump injury but it was obviously much more serious than what she had revealed to her dad right then okay by morning on January 3, so the night, the day and the night of January 2 has been an extremely rough and very dramatic night, right? And they have been very lucky, very fortunate that they are still alive and able to save themselves. By morning on January 3, the pumps had the water level sufficiently under control for us to take two hours of rest in rotation. So each one would get some amount of rest is what they were this thing. They have not slept through the night. But we still had a tremendous leak somewhere below the water line and on checking I found that nearly all the boats main rib frames were smashed down to the keel. Keel essentially is the steel structure which kind of provides the base structure of the ship. Also you realize you know they had of course practiced a lot in the British waters right for the in the for the choppy weather and the choppy waves that they would face but obviously no amount of practice is good enough when the real thing arrives right and this is something which is a very important lesson for all of us in life in general like you know net practice jitna bhi karo main thing hota hai jab maidan mein khud enter karke 22 yard ke pitch par gendbazi ko face karna hota hai that is the real test of character of personality of technique if you are a batsman right in fact there was nothing holding up a whole section of the keyboard hull except a few cupboard partitions hull is basically the framework of the ship vessel we had survived for 15 hours that's important we have survived for 15 hours since the wave hit but wave walker wouldn't hold together long enough for us to reach australia okay that's their destination I checked our charts and calculated that there were two small islands a few hundred kilometers to the east. One of them, Isle Amsterdam, was a French scientific base. 
okay our only hope of reaching this pin pricks in the indian vast ocean now pin pricks means in the vast ocean they are so small they are almost as small as a pin head you know a small pin prick how much of a space it would have in the vast ocean these islands were only that small okay but unless the wind and the seas abated so we could hoist sail our chances would be slim indeed because only then only if they hoist the sail they will be able to go out and probably somebody would also spot them the great wave had put our auxiliary engine out of action so they were in trouble in terms of the operational part okay on january 4 another day has passed after 36 hours of continuous pumping we reached the last few centimeters of water so things are getting a little better on the ship now we had only to keep pace with the water still coming in so obviously there is a leak water comes in but they were constantly pumping out so they were still kind of they, they were a little better and they were on top of the situation right then on the 4th of january we could not set any sail on the main mast pressure on the rigging would simply pull the damaged section of the hull apart so we hoisted the storm jib and headed for where i thought the two islands were mary found some corned beef and cracker biscuits and we ate our first meal in almost two days so this is significant even in the face of adversity two small children managing to actually show a lot of character the entire family actually having a meal after uh, two days you know so that is something again very important and you need to make a note of points like these but our respite was short lived okay at 4 pm black clouds began building up behind us within the hour the wind was back to 40 knots and the seas were getting higher so once again the weather and the seas are getting very very rough the weather continued to deteriorate throughout the night and by dawn on january 5 our situation was again desperate okay so they're almost back to square one on january 5 after a bit of a lull in terms of decent weather they got on the 3rd of january right when i went in to comfort the children john asked daddy are we going to die children most of the time actually expect the worst they think the world is going to come to an end in this case the son who is 6 years old is thinking he may not understand death in the way it is but he thinks it is kind of coming to an end that they may not be able to survive this entire ordeal on the high seas okay i tried to assure him that we could make it but daddy he went on we aren't afraid of dying if we can all be together you and mummy you and i so look at the kind of maturity by the 6 year old child and also that little kid's uh, inclination that he says that we are not afraid to die not that he may understand death in the in the sense death really is but he says that if all of us are together that's you know pretty good itself you know so he's almost able to see a silver lining even among the dark clouds on the high seas okay so it shows a lot of character of both the children sue and john as we have seen through these two examples right i could find no words with which to respond but i left the children's cabin determined to fight the sea with everything i had and this character showed by both his children actually provided the ammunition to the father that he would actually fight the seas with everything he had and the everything here refers to the uh, the kind of uh, uh, encouragement the kind of talk both sue and john gave to the father that he said that at least for the sake of his children that is the everything that is referred to that is really providing him with the encouragement and the ammunition to fight the high seas to protect the weakened starboard side i decided to heave to with the undamaged port hull facing the oncoming waves using an improvised sea anchor of heavy nylon rope and two 22 liter plastic barrels of paraffin a paraffin is a colorless oil liquid okay it's also flammable you know it can catch fire that evening mary and i sat together holding hands as the motion of the ship brought more and more water in through the broken plank so it's almost like you know they decide that we are in it together and that's what is really most important the family of four is in it together and the couple actually hold hands together is almost trying to tell the seas that we are going to take this on together okay we both felt the end was very near but you see the contrast while the sun is able to see something positive that he is able to say that even if we die at least we will die as a family together 
the couple probably because of the years they are feeling a little more negative and despondent right but wave walker rode out of the storm so in fact the ship also has showed a lot of character the ship in that sense is almost an extension of the personality of the family of four that the ship also decides that it will actually also brave the rough elements and by the morning of january 6 so it's, it's almost like every day with the in wind easing i try to get a reading on the sextant now sextant is an instrument uh, for measuring angles and distances okay uh, back in the chart room i worked on wind speeds changes of course drift and current in an effort to calculate our position the best i could determine was that we were somewhere in 150000 kilometers of ocean looking for a 65 kilometer wide island what he referred to as pin pricks in the vast ocean so that is the kind of kilometer range right 150000 kilometers and they are looking for a small island isle amsterdam which is just about 65 kilometers wide while i was thinking sue moved painfully moving painfully joined me the left side of her head was now very swollen and her blackened eyes narrowed to slits she gave me a card she had made on the front she had drawn caricatures of mary and me with the words here are some funny people did they make you laugh i laughed a lot as well inside was a message oh how i love you both so this card is to say thank you and let's hope for the best somehow we had to make it so you see how the children are the ones who are actually kind of egging them on pushing them to give their 100% in order to save themselves and the entire family so what sue said at the beginning about her injury then what john says and now the card these are examples of character shown by this 7 and 6 year old children i checked and rechecked my calculations we had lost our main compass now compass is an instrument to tell directions with a magnetized needle okay so he had lost his main compass it is not working and i was using a spare which had not been corrected for magnetic variation so it is obviously not good enough i made an allowance for this and another estimate of the influence of the westerly currents which flow through this part of the indian ocean about 2 pm i went on deck and asked larry to steer a course of 185 degrees if we were lucky i told him with a conviction i did not feel so even while he gave the instructions to larry he was not very convinced about how correct he actually would be he would he could expect to see the island at about 5 pm then with a heavy heart i went below climbed on my bunk and amazingly dozed off so he is so tired and almost feeling very very despondent very you know he is completely feeling down that you know he is not going to be right and they are not going to be able to find that island which stretches for 65 kilometers when i woke up it was 6 pm and growing dark i knew we must have missed the island and with the sail we had left we couldn't hope to beat back into the westerly winds which would again face the way walker at that moment a tousled head okay a tousled head appeared to my bunk can i have a hug jonathan asked sue was right behind him now tousled head essentially means that you know a uh, disheveled kind of hair you know hair which is you know uh, looking a complete mess and that is referring to the sun why am i getting a hug now i asked because you are the best daddy in the whole world and the best captain the son replied not today john i am afraid why you must be said sue in a matter of fact voice you found the island so even though he was not very convinced about the directions which he had given to um, um, larry he was actually right what i shouted it's out there in front of us they chorused saying it together as big as a battleship I rushed on deck and gazed with relief as the stark outline of Isle Amsterdam. It was only a bleak piece of volcanic rock with little vegetation, the most beautiful island in the world. So, it's also the most beautiful not just in terms of picturesque beauty, but that was what even though it had very little vegetation, look at the irony, that is what was actually going to save them and provide them with life. you know the irony no vegetation uh, looking like a battleship but that was what was life right 
we anchored offshore for the night and the next morning all the 28 inhabitants so only 28 people lived on that island cheered as they helped us ashore with land under my feet again my thoughts were full of larry and herbie cheerful and optimistic under the direst stress you know a whole lot of stress no sleep lack of food and yet they had made it and of mary who stayed at the wheel for all those crucial hours most of all i thought of a seven-year-old girl who did not want us to worry about a head injury which subsequently took remember this subsequently took six minor operations to remove a recurring blood clot between skin and skull so it was a very very serious injury which sue had suffered on board the ship and of a six-year-old boy who was not afraid to die and that is what gives the title to this particular story we are not afraid to die if we can all be together so the the moral of the story if i may use the word is essentially that if you are in it something together you can actually take on any adversity in the world and that is really the big moral from the story that you can face any adversity any danger in the world if you fight it together okay uh, in this particular case even though they were not physically helping the father the kind of words of encouragement and the kind of character and personality shown by his little kids john and sue is what motivated and pushed and encouraged the father to give his 100% and ensure that they were on course and they were able to save themselves reaching this little island, Isle Amsterdam. So that is essentially the story. As I said, you will need to know a few of the details. Be familiar with the uh, sea terms, um, seafaring terms that have been used in the particular story. That is important. I've explained a few of them out there. Um, there is also a, a, a diagram of how a ship looks like uh, which has been given out here. Uh, also, what is more important is the, the, the personality of the four members of the family and that is what you will really be questioned on as far as the examination is concerned. But while you are writing the examinations, if you are able to mix in a few of those terms in order to make your answer look that much more convincing, relevant, uh, it will definitely do you much better in the examination as far as the marking scheme is concerned. Right? So, I hope this particular chapter is clear from the Hornbill textbook. Thank you very much for watching. Do track Study with Sudhir for all the stories and chapters and poems from the Hornbill textbook from the CBSE Class 11 English Syllabus. Thank you very much.